<laughs> okay, should I mute the room, Mark? Let's do it. All right. And here we go. Welcome, everybody, to day three of the Lip Balm International Surrealist Poetry Extravaganza. Um, uh, we were with you last weekend. We had some amazing readers, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit about the, uh, toward the end of the show. Um, but tonight we have the revered Charles Alexander. Uh, we have Luke Beasley from Australia. We have Andrew Geron from San Francisco. We have Maxine Chernoff, I believe, also from San Francisco. We have Jeffrey Cyphers Wright from New York, uh, Stuart Ross from Canada, uh, Dahlia Fatale from Chicago, F.J. Bergman from somewhere in the Midwest. <laughs> You're going to kill me for this, I know. Um, and Linda Black from the UK. Um, and we also have uh, a special presentation from the folks at Station Hill Press, uh, Sam Truitt and Michael Ruby. Um, which uh, we, will, we will see in the middle of the show. Um, Dahlia is a contortionist and she will be performing a surrealist contortion performance to my own music. Um, so let's see how that one goes. Um, but to kick us off, um, I'm gonna introduce first my co-host, Jonathan Penton. Um, Jonathan has been running unlikelystories.org um, since 1998. Um, he, um, which is uh, Unlikely Stories is an electronic journal of literature and arts. Since then, he's lent his editorial and management assistance to a number of literary and artistic ventures such as Mad Hat, the New Orleans Poetry Festival, Rigorous and Big Bridge. In 2005, he founded Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five books of poetry a year. He's organized literary performances and performed himself across the United States. His poetry books are Last Chat from Virgin Press, Blood and Salsa and P Painting Rust, Prosthetic Gods, and Standards of Sadity from Litfest Press in 2016. And more recently, the free e chapbook Backstories, which you can download from Argus Books. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> so as the regulars are very used to hearing me say, I'm not very prolific. So what I do most weeks is read a poem that we recently published at unlikelystories.org. And today I'd like to read The Joyful Sea by Frederick Pollock. And it's a post-human uh, poem, which I thought might be fun today. Whales, smaller now, approach the shore to urge a creature like the proto-bear that, that became the proto-whale to adopt the life aquatic. A late big post dog whose ears might become interesting, think the whimsical late whales. The dog considers their arguments and begins to hunt the shallows, then further out and to breed accordingly. An ex penguin who moving north had tried land for a while, lopes past him to splash back into the ocean. The largely depleted sky is crossed by former fish. Former birds do better in the water. The seas do their big storms between one coastline and another, some further now, some closer. For a while they did it to cleanse themselves, but for ages the last junk has been powdered and sunk. It's just high temperature now and spirits. Days pass and the depths, a former former dog addresses a former whale. Though neither can look up when the light's too bright, the first retains an ancient politeness. Why did you invite us down here? We kept our fangs, they grew, we eat you. Now the sun's expanding. Did you just want to give us an extra hour or two? The whale, though by now talked out, says mildly, perhaps we figured we'd want company. Again, that was by Frederick Pollock. All right, next up, I'd like to introduce our co-host, Cassandra Atherton. Cassandra is an award-winning writer, scholar of prose poetry, and professor of writer and writing and literature in Melbourne. Her most recent books of prose poetry are Pre-Raphaelite, Leftovers, and Fugitive Letters. She is currently writing a book of prose poetry on the atomic bomb with funding from the Australia Council. I've read it, it's wonderful. 
Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry and Introduction and the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. She is commissioning editor for Westerly Magazine. Cassandra, will you read us a poem today? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've got two super short ones, um, both prose poems. Um, the first one's called Yellow Brick Road. I live in the tall yellow building in your heart. Tower-like, rapunzel I wait for you to dislodge me from your upper left chamber so that I can go home. Inside this lone Tetris block, I imagine I am inhabiting part of the yellow brick road, a fragment of golden path from the eastern quadrant in Munchkin City. At sunset, your heart burns a hole in my ruby slippers. Cinnamon. The Tamazapam has stopped blocking you from my dreams. At 3 a.m. you cleave the darkness with Michael on Darchi and three cinnamon quills in your hand. I shuffle over two body widths and we lie ear to ear in the tenebrous room. Below our nakedness, the bark writes honey dust on crisp sheets. Cinnamon infused, we heat up, our wrists floating upwards. And now I would like to introduce Mark Vinsen. So join along if you uh, um, remember parts of his very distinctive bio. Mark Vincennes is an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist and musician. He's published 15 books of poetry, including more recently, Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light, Station Hill Press, Here Comes the Night Dust, Salmon Poetry, and Einstein Fledermouse from Sir Vision Books. Vincenzo's newest collection, The Little Book of Earthly Delights, was just released from Spite and Dival. An album of music, ambience, and verse, Left Hand Clapping, is forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincenzo is also a prolific translator and is translated from German, Romanian, and French. He has published 10 books of translations, most recently Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz with White Pine, and it was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in Translation. His translation of Mertz's selected poems in Audible Blue is forthcoming from White Pine Press in the fall. Vincennes is editor and publisher of the spectacular Mad Hat Press and the publisher of New American Writing. Here we go. He's lived all over the world, from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but now lives on a farm in rural Western Massachusetts overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain and where there are more silver hair bats, long-tailed weasels and northern short-tailed shrews than people. Well, that wasn't disappointing at all, Mark. Will you please read for us? Thanks, Cassandra. Um, yeah, I'm running out of tongue twisters to give you. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm considering going down to the bacterial level to, to give you to, for the list, you know? Excellent. Uh, I can't wait for a few bugs. <laughs> so, so can we do Latin as well? No, then I'll have to get up earlier and practice. You'll have to send me a like word file on how to say it. <laughs> Um, this poem is from a book um, I'm working on at the moment called 39 Wonders and Other Management Issues, and it's called Ritual. Nonsensical to pass through each house to clear the air of ghosts by ringing a rusty temple bell. The light of the April day scorns your true beauty. Even when my heart is in an angle, the sun elevates. Hold out your hands and spin in a circle dervishly. Of course, you are adored by the dreamers and the love you seek will be poured upon you. In time, the fellowships of ancient societies fade, the spirits in all their kindred fallacies too. All the sense is in the grain of the wood, deep in the structure. And when it has been struck by lightning, the scarred grief holds us up by our feet. Tenuous, an old man traversing rocks in a flowing stream, I'd love to be able to lie to you, but my hands reveal all. The fire of that kiss from forever, the storm that raised the cornfields, the bounties unleashed in the rain, ashes, on the other hand, can be deceiving. For now, let us just stroll into the distance where the sun flies low along this plot of land. Thank you, everybody. Um, and I'm delighted uh, as the beginning of um, 
day three to um, invite Charles Alexander to the, to the Zoom stage. Um, Charles is a poet, bookmaker, professor, founder director of Chats Press. He's the author of six full length books of poetry and 13 chat books of poetry, editor of one critical work on the state of book arts in America, author of multiple essays, articles, and reviews. Most recent books of poetry are At the Edge of the Sea, Pushing Water to Singing Horse Press, Pushing Water, and the chapbook Some Sentences Look for Some Periods, and Two Pushing Waters, from both, both from Little Red Leaves textile series. Pushing Water 3 is forthcoming from Cuneiform Press. Uh, Charles has taught literature and writing at Naropa University of Arizona uh, include, and elsewhere, including University of Houston, Victoria, where he directed the MFA Creative Writing Program and managed the UHV Center for the Arts from 2014 to 2018. He's a past recipient of the Arizona Arts Award and has participated in the Tamas Poetry uh, Project in Paris, the US Poets in Mexico Program, and the seventh <clears throat> and eighth International Chinese American Poetry and Poetics Conferences in Wuhan and Hangzhou, China. In April 2019, he was a keynote speaker and lecturer in the Swan Shakespeare Lecture Series sponsored by Southwest University in Chongqing, China. Um, in the works is his selected poems translated into Mandarin by Chen Du uh, to be published forthcoming. During the pandemic, um, he has developed and participated in various projects, including reading series, poetry videos, um, conferences and, and virtual poetry marathons. Um, in June 2021, he was named <clears throat> the fifth winner in the Lord Knows Award for Outstanding Life of Time Achievement in Literary Publishing. Charles lives in Tucson, Arizona with his partner, the painter Cynthia Miller. Um, Charles began as Chax Press in 1989 to continue the work he'd started while studying the book arts, i.e. to explore relationships of book forms uh, to contemporary poetry in both trade and fine art editions. Chax Press believes that poetry is continually exploring what it has done and what it will do. There are no bounds on the book or its content. Charles Olson said that form is never more than extension of content. In talking about poems, uh, but speaks equally of book, which communicates both as a form for its content and as a form on its own. Uh, Chax Press has now published over uh, 250 books, mostly of poetry, uh, but has also sponsored readings, multi-art events, symposia, and small conferences, podcasts, and many more in an attempt to make a difference in terms of the impact of poetry in our lives. Uh, welcome, Charles. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. That was, that was far more than I expected, <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate it. I'm going to read, I think, two poems today, and one is from the long work Pushing Water and Pushing Water 73. It, it was very interesting to think about my work through this surrealist lens because I have been accused by a couple of people of being a, a surrealist, but it's not necessarily a title I've ever sought or put on myself, but here we go. Pushing Water 73. The dictionary cannot tell a broken word from one ejected through a body's hole an oracular and winding orifice. The stranger in the street may be from a small town in Texas or Syria and today has turned itself outward. No light but darkly, no smell escapes a partial repugnance. We are the willing, we are the holy and we are smashed, pressed, cut, placed and must acknowledge our complicity and our pleasure in being held and being released. Wear a silk blouse to feel the air between the buildings. The world is not floating if it has sunk. Has it sunk? If you have children, give them up or let them give you to the side of the hill to be uncovered in a further slide. Evanescent or just the window closing on one's fingers in a high story in a story highly told. The setting retroactive, 
backward active radio on action between improbable stasis where things are thrown at our feet, at our faces, at our former nations. Babies have no steps in this winded lack. What corresponds in the corner, something meets and fluids out or taken back. The police, even the police are surprised by their own shooting, her own shooting coming out in the dark, not based on a public proposition or figuring the community will to want, hosting an entry and immigration, a refuge here. Why did you not take the medicine, the pill, the immunization, the instigation, sitting on a rock with algae? fungus. If we or someone else swallows the water, we ingest one another only to throw out, to run along our own edges and be lost there, as open, as want, as a line with no marking, none at all. A conjecture, an objection, absurd or abjected unions of the unsound, undivided, rejectamenda of the moment we live. And the next one is uh, very new and it's called Lifting Wing. And it uh, uh, started off as a response to a comment with a friend about, uh, about puns, but I should say there's also a wing always right outside my window of a hawk that we're watching grow from a baby to an adult. Lift a wing, sing, little singer, ring, ring, a pun spun upon, a word run among, little hawk squawk, ma and pa roar, ah, in the leaves left or the lives bereft of rules and regulations formation. Lift eye to huge sky in a post rain frame, the summons upon us. Fly now or try, resist, gravity does not insist. Sun's blast not yet cast in extreme heat, defeat before autumn plummet toward some downward prophet's words, prophet's motive, exploding while iceberg eroding, ocean unfolding motion to star, alas, afar in a water order or a broader motor far-flung field flame to rename and untame, reframe, unshame, and unalign the sign and the cosine sign shine till almost blind spot and shot and not singularly syllabary, minded, unwinded, unearthed and birthed. Forth was the firth the free, the freeze, breeze overseas, siesta unless disaster, raster and vector, master and rector, sequester, not fester, unless your wrist remainders the danger. Now anger reminds, caterwauling behind a cat or a wall, no mind becomes a moment without some torment fortune's mortuary. If the slip slips, the fall falls, the mind unminds, the triptych in thirds replays the open chords, rephrase the harmonic fracture, the unforeseen conjunction, the wings wing lifted and sifted, but fast and waste not, safe and sound found outside the compound, inside the insight, among the hmong, or furrowing the forwards, frown not brown cow, not brown milk or moan grass. Of course, an ass is a sassy lad and asks forgiveness only badly on a Wednesday wind and wing a word home, bring a girl a phone, make a promise rose and rise a surprise on a day of rest, a stay of circumstance and confusion, momentary or monumental nights fight for lasting sight where what lasts or loves well remains in reach, not preach or beach, towel, trowel to vowel, 
a and e amen to she and her seaman free man in paris where the ferris wheel across the channel churns the sea so shoes wave up and save their laces for traces and faces in the crowd aloud for sakes aloud and shake a sound astounding right in the river bend the silver run the shiver snow beguiles the child for just an hour not with power but powder but not louder no shouting lifting wing just swing lifting sing a high song strong wing soar upon pun sprung and spun long thank you charles thank you very much i'm winded uh, Go on. Um, did you did you want to say something, Charles? No, no, no. I just said I'm, I'm slightly winded after that. <laughs> I see. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. But it was great. It was fantastic. Um, next, we have uh, Linda Black, who is a poet and artist, printmaker, painter, collagist. She's published three collections with Shearsman, uh, Slant, Root, and Inventory in 2008. Uh, the most recent being Slant from 2016. And also the son of a shoemaker from Hearing Eye Press. Um, collage prose poems based on the life of Hans Christian Andersen with the author's pen and ink illustrations uh, was the subject of a Poetry Cafe exhibition in 2013. Uh, Linda teaches for the Poetry School and is co-editor of the Long Poem magazine, which I highly recommend to all of you, uh, www longpoemmagazineoneword.org.uk. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just, just to, I'm sorry to make a little correction, but um, I did, uh, my updated bio, which I did think I'd sent, um, I've had a new book out from Shearsman called Ben, and I'll read a little bit um, from, from that. Um, and I'm actually editor now of Long Poem Magazine. So I'm sorry, but I just had to... Um... Oh, no, no, of course, of course. No. <laughs> okay. actually, actually, I think I took it off your website. Sorry? I think I took it off your oh, website. Oh, you probably took it off the website, yeah. Oh, I'll have to update it. Thank you very much. All right, um, I'm, I'm going to begin um, with... Um, childhood actually so uh first book inventory um which also has some illustrations in it i'm going to introduce you to well they're not with us anymore but my parents my father my father had six fingers a hooked nose and one eye my father had a hinge jaw and no teeth a dewdrop and a pack of woodbines my father had a gold signet ring, swollen knuckles, and his hands were claws. My father wore braces and shat in a bucket under the stairs. My father sat on the low stool, lighting the boiler for hours. He sat on a high stool, eating bananas and bread. My father had a mother, but I did not know her. My father had a father, but I did not know him. My father had a grey paisley scarf. My father made tea for my mother, but I did not know her. My father took me to the playground in Potter Newton Park. This was before he had an iron leg. Eyes spun round and round. My mother milked my father. My father opened the door to Uncle Charlie. My father nodded and shuffled. My mother's stepmother liked my father. She told me this in a car outside Chislehurst Caves. She said it was a bad match. My mother told me, I want never gets. If he were here, I think he would be standing, staring at nothing. I think he would be leaning backwards. I think he would look like he might fall over. My father had hollow legs. My mother is locked in a jar of ginger. 
I hear her battling with the lid, trying to hump herself out of the sickly liquid. It suits me not to let her out. I hear her invective, shite and bugger. I shall continue to disappoint. Her suspender is stuck. She is tugging at her roll-on. Let's have some music, something with a thump to it. And I'm going to go on to um, another uh, childhood, a very different childhood. And this is the childhood of Hans Christian Andersen. And uh, it's from uh, The Son of a Shoemaker. And um, it's, coll it's collage prose po poems from a book written in the 1940s, which is a fictionalized life of Hans Christian Andersen. And it was written by Constance Buell Burnett. And um, okay, yeah. So Hans was born on the 2nd of April. His, oh, I didn't put the date down. Oh, well, long time ago. Um, his father was a shoemaker and his mother was a, a washerwoman and her name was Anne-Marie. So here we are. Not, nor the most prosperous. Going without needed more, but cared less. So far did his thoughts carry, they often had to speak to him twice, dependent on no one's hire. With hammer and needle and knife, he could lay his hands far beyond. A rude wooden shelf contained everything out of the same piece of calico, except on their backs, the four shining plates, spotless and tidy. Reverent fingers turned foolish dreams into small garments. Her shiftless parents had driven her to beg nor a decent dress, to be a scholar. Frustrated in boyhood, as from scorn, his mind under the rumpled blonde thatch was never meant he broke the silence, she pushed. Indignantly for the poor little one, he read aloud from the plays of Holberg. So there we have his birth. On Sundays, his head was washed. The voice of new life curled against his index finger under its compelling influence. Ugly little face, tiny waving fist, cradled in the crook of a small trundle bed. Thou art going to be tall. Odd pieces of silk pinned across his breast to simulate a waistcoat as only a mother could. His father and mother thought very differently. She often took him to the asylum to play. While she raped and swept, he outgrew. Then in she would don her one good basket, enchanted and green-flecked, and turn the key on her mountain, which never seemed to d diminish. But she was only a peasant. So I'm going to um, move on to, 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 to then, which Cassandra has had before. Um, as I say, published a combination of, of verse and prose poems, but I, oh look, <laughs> I, I, um, I'm going to focus, <laughs> I'm going to focus on, on, on the prose poems, which, are, um, um, and uh, I will say that I was once criticised after a reading for not giving introductions to each of my poems. So I'm going to let these speak for themselves. So this is the first poem in the book. Time is of the effervescence, then it's popped. Likewise, a pillar of well-being. Too much taboo convenes the notion all's well. Many are non-believers, confounding the desire to know. An expansive watch tells it all. It isn't over yet. The addition of qualifiers proves it. Prints more than one copy, copy more than one print. 
then you have an addition, each an original, so to speak. Signature consumes time. The stress she is wearing does not come off in the wash, nor fall discarded to the bathroom floor. Tolerate the unknown, the, intim the intimation. In turn are the hours. Parameters reach outward. The twang of elastic nullifies the outcome. Come out and play pity. A visit to the cinema can be a panacea. The rule comes free inside the cracker, coils in hand. Trifle is lighter on the stomach. This is the wider palate, though succinct. A dichotomy requires lunch like any other. The menu only guessed at. Press the space bar, separate meat and milk, as did some forefathers, hers anyway. Measures for safekeeping, a hand spick and span, a table spoon, tawdry by definition, a second hand back, hands back, what cannot be divvied up. Stay still, why don't you? Epic. On the dot. Safety behind the door, larger than the frame it purports to fit. Come winter, down it goes, contradicted and back to size. A swell beginning for a venture. The boy is getting too much for me, said Mr. Cruncher, A Tale of Two Cities, Dickens. I have seen him before with his dimly lit eyes, his incalcitrant lip, his sweat and bones, too little, too leaning, though I admit to liking that in a wall or the trunk of a tree. Don't think I am harshly inclined. I had heard his mood, his malefaction, his slight tendency of mind, tasted the fruit of his carapace. Sweetly, I dazed upon him, framed his face in the ovaries of his eyes. He needed a benefactor, but maybe so did I. Don't think I complain. I had seen him skip reading the last page first. When I snorted, he would not retort. He had read many an ending, for that was his concern. Apparently, he'd been brought up that way with many ways to predict his future, but one. Please don't imagine I am credulous. I heard his wimp, his whine and snarl, his sneer and the occasional giggle. He would play the trumpet while I could only figure. I added his pluses and minuses, condemned his indifference, then subtracted. Don't wonder at my disparity. I saw what I wanted, for which I am not proud. Each prolonged stare became only a stump in an ever-changing stratosphere. His socks were always dirty white. Do not think I snub. I saved up my pennies, bought him drain pipes to share goodwill. They sparkled like disintegrated diamonds. I played tiddlywinks, jacks, pin the tail, but not with him. I saw him scrutinise the flick of my thumb, my ping-pong retaliation. I hit him, but, but he still peered through me, every which way, ubiquitous like Wally, a pale flame, like Will of the Wisp. And um, I will read... Two more. Um, where? And that's spelled W A R E. Enid Sini, born 1931, died 2011, drew kidney shaped coffee tables, 50s sideboards, easy chairs, day's recliner, Bernadette's sofa, domestic objects fair flew across the plates. Everyday pottery makes a home. Masons cracks easily for all its wealth. 
A muffin maker makes plates four to 500 in a day, generally about 320, no more than seven inches in diameter. Is it necessary to explain? Concerning cutlery were canteens, spoons not to be confused, fish knives, sugar tongs, crumb trails, liberated mold, the road forks, where, oh where, other than earth, takes the same type of biscuit. Eric Gill, born 1882, died 1940, left Ditchling Village for Hopkins Crank, an unreconstructed Georgian squatter's cottage, home killed pig, home baked bread, all be in the soup together. Animalistic variations, the cow of a jug, funneled mouth, hind parts hidden, big belly sprouting, relative coziness, preliminary to something less uncommon. Neither the schools nor society had tinctured his strong nature. Silicosis, chronic, simple, minus thysis, grinders, asthma, potters, rot can be complicated running in all weathers, considerably heated, 130 degrees Fahrenheit, little legs breathing in. At the age of seven, his education being complete, he was summoned into the world. Darius was first taken to work by his mother. It was the winter of 1835, January. J.B. Davis, surgeon, circa 1840. Did you know George Formby, born 1904, died 1961, held the world premiere of his first sound film, Boots Boots, in Burslem in 1934, nasal, high-pitched. Teapot, 15 shillings. Morning cups, two shillings and sixpence. Two tumblers and a custard cup with a handle. Parian and porcelain, white wear and luster, the blackened town hall. Like a dark Pleiades in a green and empty sky, Hanbridge has the shape of a horse and its rider, Bursley of a half donkey, Knipe of a pair of trousers, Longshore of an octopus, and little Turnbill of a beetle. The floors were often thick with wasted clay. Hannah Barlow, born 1861, died 1916, kept a menagerie, an expert tube liner despite losing the use of her right hand. Women, through, since ancient times, seldom brought to light, limited look at Jane Eyre, fainting, ribs removed, paintress, redress, hourglass, not accidental, 75 pound bags of clay, spontaneous abortion. Fiance, impasto, marquetry, Carrara, Dalton Lambeth, large stoneware, Tig, Sigfrito, decorated with leaping and grazing deer, impressed back stamp, dated 1876, in very good condition, no chips, cracks, hairlines, or restoration, 850 pounds. Pair of Royal Dalton, Lambeth, Hannah Barlow, goats, and children vases, circa 1900, 1,320 pounds. Buy it now or make an offer. Other artists' work has floundered and died. I think I'd best leave it there. I think I've had my time. Um, so thank you very much for asking me. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Much, much appreciated and wonderful reading. Um, next, we hear from uh, our old friend, Andrew Duran, who was playing with Clark Coolidge's band, um, Ouroboros, right, uh, this last weekend, um, and is the, uh, this last Sunday, and is the author of Absolute Letter, a collection of poems published by Flood Editions. Um, Andrew's previous poetry collections include Trance Archive, New and Selected Poems, from City Lights, The Removes from Hard Press, Fathom from Black Square Editions, and The Sound Mirror from Flood Editions in 2008. The Cry at Zero, a selection of his prose poems and critical essays was published by Counterpath Press in 2007. 
from Germany is translated the literary essays of Marxist utopian philosopher Ernst Bloch uh, and the perpetual motion machine by the proto dana fantasist Paul Scherbart. Um, as a musician, Andrew plays the theremin in various experimental, experimental and free jazz ensembles. Uh, and he teaches at San Francisco State University. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for having me. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, a sound poem, uh, not by me, but by Philip Lamantia, who's widely considered the first and the greatest uh, American surrealist poet. He made contact with Andre Breton in the 40s as a teenager. Uh, Lamantia was a teenager, and Breton hailed him as a voice that rises once in 100 years. Um, and he uh, passed away in 2005 and had the, um, the pleasure and the honor of, of knowing him personally in the, in the last 10 years of his life. So this is a sound poem. It's inspired equally by Dada, sound poetry, uh, jazz, scat singing, and um, Native American chant. Uh, Philip hung out with uh, Native American, uh, the Washoe tribe, uh, uh, and shared, uh, participated in their peyote rituals. So this is a, a sound poem that's entitled Scat. I'm gonna um, call up my, my totem animal to help me uh, read this poem. And this I offer this as a, a sort of a, a talisman against the spirits of fascism that are stalking the land. Okay, Scat. Ya na ruk, alo ya lepreb lop omori, tes ogin, chinsin run, u matini. O ye mayoma, O ye mayoma, O ye mayoma, O ya, me ha, O me, O ole, E hamalo, O ho, maha, 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 me ho, mo he, O ma, he me. Maho Ia Nakoma Eka Tsa Eka Tsa Ips Klegarabob Ule Ababab Amatuleb Batagang Ari A Lemeto Insigi Chichichin Stomala Stomari Ak. And that was Philip Lamantia. Um, and you can find that in uh, Philip's uh, collected poems from University of California Press. Uh, which came out in 2013. Um, tell us, tell us a, a little bit about Philip, um, Andrew. Uh, well, as I mentioned, um, he's one of the earliest uh, American surrealist poets, and um, he submitted some as a teenager. He submitted some poems to the um, the the New York Surrealist Magazine, VVV and View. Uh, those were the magazines that uh, the surrealists were putting out in New York while they were in exile. Uh, there during World War II, having fled the Nazis, um, and when those when those poems appeared in in the, the magazine, uh, people in New York were bowled over by them, and they summoned Philip out to from San Francisco. Philip was born and raised uh, in San Francisco, uh, where he also died, but he took a, a wartime train across the country to New York to meet with the the, the group of surrealists in exile, and that's when he met with Andre Breton, um, and you know he. He also uh, hung out with the Beats later on. Uh, Kenneth Re Rexroth was one of his mentors. And so he was sort of present at the creation of the Beat movement. Um, and uh, he went back and forth. And uh, for a while, he identified more as a Beat poet than a Surrealist. But he ended his life uh, strongly identifying with Surrealism. Uh, and also, he, he returned to his roots in Catholicism. So he was one of the rare surrealist uh, relig uh, mystics and religious um, uh, exponents. And uh, one of his last uh, phrases was, God is a surrealist. Um, so um, yeah, a really unique figure on, on the American literary scene, and very influential. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Please, please yeah. go on. OK, so um, now I'm going to read uh, uh, a poem that's titled The Removes. It's the title in my collection, The Removes. And it's based on a, a, this, a, a metaphor that uh, comes from the Count Lotriamon. I'll put his name in the, in the chat. Um, this was an, uh, a French, uh, writing in French, but uh, origin Uruguay in uh, the early 20th century. He's considered a proto-surrealist, a precursor of the surrealists. And his book, um, Mel Doror, um, Songs of Mel Doror, 
uh, was, was highly influential on the original group of surrealists. And it, uh, especially because it had metaphors like, like this, uh, the chance meeting on a dissecting table of an umbrella and a sewing machine. So as we all know, uh, surrealist imagery uh, is, is involved with putting together uh, very distant aspects of reality and creating an image out of that uh, dissonant and incongruent aspects of reality. And the, the, the surrealists hailed that metaphor in particular uh, as, as a paradigm of what they wanted to achieve uh, in, in, in their own surrealist writing. So um, the prose poem I'm, I'm about to read um, uh, uh, from my collection, The Removes, uh, is based on that metaphor. After the time epidemic, the eyes of owls were found embedded throughout the soft balustrades, reminders of a fateful plan, your cellmates in this centuries wide prison whose actual walls have yet to be discovered will soon deploy against you. This is understandable. You are waiting to achieve your paradigm, a damaged star. Running like smoke from the chamber of ills, your signature commences. Against the operations of chance, you write, it is sufficient to call upon the sign of the umbrella, that which opens outward, or the sewing machine, that which stitches together, inasmuch as meaning will be defined systematically as a series of openings and closings upon the dissecting table of language. Thus, the words of your confession appear as vestiges of an original speechlessness ragged holes in the firmament. What phoneme in integers is also present in jewels? Why answer? The laws of thermodynamics can't forgive you because your name is a darkened festival of sound. Here then is the gift of your exhaustion, a precious animal stroked to transparency. Here too is a windowless sunset, its proof scratched out by the charred branches of your eyes. Your pursuers inevitable still trust in the parallelism of acts where desires converge, yet space itself must be spoken aloud, the emanation of a veil. Um, and I'm gonna read a brand new one now. Um, and the, the title is two letters and a number, M and eight, um, M and eight. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of getting that as a license plate if nobody else has taken it yet. M and eight. Um, stand before a mirror and you become a member of another world. Stand behind a name and the world becomes a member of itself. So make a map of all the eyes you've ever met. Find a path through the mirrors of thine others. Continuity is the essence of the abyss. To radiate, leave it all behind. To emanate, stay connected to the source. Wave phantom, the ship of state. Who cares, who carries, who cures? Write your answer here on the most reflective surface. Dear observer, as space expands, never is misspelled as nerver. So the mind is blinded by perception. So reading, is reanimation of the dead. And Mark, I'm gonna leave it there uh, with those three poems. I'm reading tomorrow and uh, I don't wanna um, overstay my welcome. So you, you, you guys will hear more from me tomorrow. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you for telling us about Philip as well. Um, by the way, if anyone hasn't, hasn't read any of his work, I highly recommend, um, you know, uh, getting his, his poems and having a good look at what Philip wrote. Quite, quite a, an amazing poet. Um, next, we're going to um, be the very lucky viewers of Sam Truitt and Michael Ruby's collaboration, uh, which they put together in a celebration of the Surrealist Poetry Extravaganza. Um, and I'm just going to introduce both of them briefly. Uh, Sam was born in Washington, DC, and he was raised there in, in Tokyo. He's the author of 10 works in the Vertical Elegies series, among others in print and other media, including most recently Toko Yaoto, ya, Yatoto, uh, and the forthcoming State Shaft, State Shaft State, 
Um, among other recognitions, he's a recipient of numerous funds um, for Poetry Awards, a Contemporary Poetry Award from the University of Georgia and a Howard Fellowship. He is the producer and co-host of the podcast Baffling Combustions. Definitely check it out. Um, and director of Station Hill Press. Uh, he lives in Woodstock, New York. Uh, for more, visit Sam Truitt, one word, dot org. Michael Ruby uh, is the author of seven full-length collections at an intersection, window on the city, the edge of the underworld, compulsive words, American Songbook from Ugly Duckling, The Mouth of the Bay from Blaze Knox, and The Star-Spangled Banner from Station Hill uh, in 2020. His trilogy in prose and poetry, Memories, Dreams, and Inner Voices came out from Station Hill in 20, uh, 2012, uh, Voices Heard Before Sleep from Argotist. He's also the author of e the e-books Close Your Eyes from Argotist and Titles and First Lines from Mudlark and five of Doozy Collective chapbooks. He co-edited Bernadette Mayer's early books, Eating the Colors of a Lineup of Words, uh, which came out from Station Hill and, and Mayer's, uh, Bernadette Mayer's and Lewis Warsh's collaboration, Piece of Cake, which I'm guessing might be Lewis's uh, last uh, book to be released or most recent book to re be released since his passing. Um, Michael lives in Brooklyn and he works as an editor of US News and Politics articles at the Wall Street Journal, among other things. Welcome, Michael and Sam. And, and so now we shall see um, this wonderful piece of art that they have put together for us. You got it, Cassandra? Yeah, yeah, I'm getting there. Hang on. I just have to open it. Here we go. The sound, Cassandra? Flat out. It, it worked for a second, but then it stopped working. Unmute yourself as well. You have to be unmuted. Why did I dream this? I want to know. I, I want to know why this action took place. What happened to this man? What happened to this woman? Is it good or is it bad? <laughs> By the shadow of the pyramid, with my wife Nancy, I should like to make the second historic announcement of the last few hours. The armies have stopped fighting. Eyes are a surprise. Princess, a dream. Buzz is spelled with Z. Fuss is spelled with S. So is business. The United States is comical. Now I want to tell you about the Monroe Doctrine. We think very nicely, we think very well of the Monroe Doctrine. American painter painting in French country near railroad track. Mobilization 
locomotive passes with notification for villages. Where are American tourists to buy my pictures? Sacre nom d'un pipe, says the American painter. American painter sits in cafe and contemplates empty pocketbook as taxi cabs file through Paris, carrying French soldiers to the Battle of the Marne. I guess I'll be a taxi driver here in Gay Paris, says the American painter. Painter sits in studio trying to learn names of streets with help of Breton peasant Femme de Menage. He becomes taxi driver. Ordinary street scene in wartime Paris. Being lazy about getting up in the mornings, he spends some of his dark nights in teaching Breton Femme de Menage, peasant girl, how to drive the taxi so she can replace him when he wants to sleep. America comes into the war. American painter wants to become American soldier. Personnel officer interviews him. What have you been doing? Taxiing. You know Paris. Secret service for you. Go on taxiing. He goes on taxiing. And he teaches Breton Femme de Menage English so she can take his place if need be. One night he reads his paper under the light. Policeman tells him to move up. Don't want to. Wants to read. Man comes up. Wants to go to the station. Painter has to take him. Gets back reading again another man comes wants to go to the station painter takes him comes back to read again two american officers come up want to go to the station the painter says tired of the station take you to berlin if you like no station. Officers say, give you a lot if you take us outside town on way to the south. First big town. He says, all right, gotta stop at home first to get my coat. Stops at home, calls out to Breton Femme de Menage. Get busy, telegraph to all your relations. You have them all over. Ask, have you any American officers staying forever? Be back tomorrow. Back tomorrow. Called up by Chief Secret Service. Goes to see him. Money has been disappearing out of quartermaster's department in chunks. You've got a free hand. Find out something. Goes home, finds Femme de Menage Breton surrounded with telegrams and letters from relatives. Americans everywhere, but everywhere. She groans. Funny Americans everywhere, but everywhere, they all said. Many funny Americans everywhere. Avignon, such a sweet American soldier, so young, so tall, so tender, not very badly hurt, but will stay a long time. He has been visited by American officers who live in a villa. Two such nice ladies 
live there too. And they spend, and they spend. They buy all the good, sweet food in Avignon. Is that something William, sir? Says the Breton, femme de menage. It's snowing, but no matter. We will get there in the taxi. Take two days and two nights, you inside and me out. Hurry. They start. The funny little taxi goes over the mountains with and without assistance. All tired out, he is inside. She is driving. When they turn down the hill into Avignon. Just then, two Americans on motorcycles come on, and Breton, femme de menage, losing her head, grand smash. American painter wakes up burned. He sees the two and says, by God, and makes believe he is dead. The two are very helpful. A team comes along and takes American painter and all to hospital. Two Americans ride off on motorcycle direction of Nimes and the Pointe de Gare. Arrival at hospital. Interview with the wounded American who described two American officers who had been like brothers to him. Didn't think any officers could be so chummy with a soldier. Took me out, treated me, cigarettes, everything fine. Where have they gone on to? To Nimes. Yes, point de gare. American painter in bed, in charge of French nursing nun, but manages to escape and leave for Point de Gare in mended taxi. There, under the shadow of that imperishable monument of the might and industry of ancient Rome, exciting duel. French gendarme, American painter, taxi, femme de menage, Breton, two American crooks with motorcycles. Great stunt. They are finally captured. They have been the receivers of the stolen money. They are finally captured. After many other adventures, so famous has become the American painter, Breton Femme de Ménage. And taxi, that in the march, under the arch, at the final triumph of the Allies. The taxi at the special request of General Pershing. Brings up the rear of the procession after the tanks, the Breton driving, and the American painter inside. Waving the American flag. And the tricolor. All right. Thank you so much, Sam and, and Michael, for that. Um, 
uh, yeah, um, I almost felt like it would have been great if there had been a flamenco guitar playing at the end or something like that, you know? Um, wonderful, thank you. Um, Thanks for having us, Mark. Say again? Thanks for having us. Oh yes, and, 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 and both uh, Sam and, and Michael will be reading uh, in person tomorrow as well. Um, yeah, thanks for putting up with that. I, yeah. Fantastic. Um, next, next we hear from, I believe, Paul Hoover. Is that right, Paul? I think, I think I got my dates mixed up between you and Maxine. Is that right? Can you on mic? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we switched. Uh, I, I have to take care of my grandson and take him out to amusement parks on Sundays. Oh, okay. I thought it was yeah, so. It's my oh, my, my prime duty on a Sunday. Gotcha. You know, I'm glad to be here on on a Saturday. Thanks, oh. Paul. Yeah. I'm gonna just quickly uh, read your bio. Um, oh. Paul was born in Harris, Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, he served as a conscientious objector in the Vietnam War, um, an experience he recounted in his novel Saigon, Illinois, published by Vintage Contemporaries. For many years, he's taught at Columbia College Chicago, um, where he founded uh, Columbia Poetry Review. He also helped establish the Poetry Center at the School of Art Institute, an important reading series with Maxine Chernoff. Um, he edited and trains, translated the selected poems of Friedrich Hölderlin, for which they both received the Penn USA Translation Award. They also edited uh, the well-known literary magazine, New American Writing, uh, which I'm proud to say that uh, Mad Hat Press is now co-publisher with, with Paul on. Um, and the new issue just came out, number 39, uh, was, which, is, which is kind of a bumper issue and some amazing poems in there. So please do check it out. You can buy it from the Mad Hat Press uh, website, uh, but uh, also from the New American Writing website. Um, Paul, um, with the Mexican poet Maria Baranda, uh, edited and translated the complete poems of uh, San Juan de la Cruz, uh, editor of postmodern. He was editor of postmodern American poetry, which was a Norton anthology, um, which came out twice in '94 and 2013. He's a professor of creative writing now at San Francisco State University, and recipient of many literary awards, including an NEA fellowship, the Frederick Book Award of Poetry, the Jerome J. Uh, Schustak Prize of American Poetry, and he lives in. Mill Valley, California, and his newest book, uh, O and Green, New and Selected Poems, is coming out from Manhattan Press imminently. Um, welcome, Paul. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Mark. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I want to read a poem by one of the Surrealists. Uh, it's translated by Michael Benedict in his, um, in the 1970s, I think it was 1975, an anthology of surreal, French Surrealist poetry. Uh, the poet is Hans Arp, also known as Jean Arp. And it's, uh, it, it depicts a kind of the, the uncanny, uh, unconscious madness of surrealism uh, with, a, with the erotic touch that they were after. It's called, I am a horse. I am riding in a train that's absolutely packed in my compartment, every seat is occupied by a lady holding a man on her lap. The air is intolerably hot. The atmosphere is stifling. All the passengers have gigantic appetites. They eat nonstop. Suddenly the men begin to whine. They want to be breastfed. They want to be suckled. They want to be nursed. They unbutton the women's blouses and clasp their breasts. They fill themselves with nice fresh milk, only I do not suckle on anyone, nor am I suckled by anyone. Nobody sits in my lap either, for I am a horse. I sit up straight and solid with my hind legs on the railroad train seat and prop myself up snugly using my forelegs. I neigh energetically he, 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 and on my chest shine all nicely aligned, the six buttons of sex appeal, just like the bright buttons on a uniform. Oh, how small this world is, how big cherries. So, Hans Arp. 
uh, I uh, searched in my, um, holy cow, what happened to my books? Uh, I was influenced uh, uh, by surrealism through people like uh, Henri Michaud uh, and with the kind of absurdist tendency and the conceptual tendency where it rides on a thought and, and on a, a unique possibility. And I love Spanish language poetry for the Spanish, for the surrealist influence. I thought it, it works better there than it does in French. Uh, so uh, I, I want to read from Poems in Spanish, which I wrote, uh, it was published uh, in 2005. And it's uh, poems written as if in Spanish. So, um, I can't claim that it's surrealist, but I hope it's of interest. The Mill. This is the evening when a bird nests in a hat left on the street by a flying man, a man of worlds and heat, of vellum and fog and sculptures that lurk when we're not looking. This is the evening. This is the moment when traffic passes as I have taught it to pass. As I have learned the way, this is the moment. This is the place where snow was invented. This is the town it falls on, consisting of three houses with plastic lights in the doorway. A man who touches his woman as she likes to be touched, no matter how warm always snow. And the hand that turns the world, this is the place. This is the life that keeps me awake at night its distances and skin. And this is time with its foot in a crack, unable to move yet passing. This is the life. This is the hour when the crime was committed. This is the first cause watching. This is the river drowning and a filthy shadow washing its hands. This is the hour. This is the little fish eating the big one. This is the man who lives by the railroad tracks. This is the train passing. This is the mill where grain was turned. This is the grain unfinished. And this is the empty bed of the stream that used to turn the wheel. This is the mill of absence. I take away my head. Uh, it's a, preceded by a quote from Jaime Sabinas. I take away my hand, which writes and speaks much. I take away my head. I take away my mouth, which remembers nothing I say, though I speak loudly and often with everything on my mind. I take away my heart, which never quite forgives me, and I remove my ears, which have no feeling for song. Moving between two lights over white stones at midnight, past nine black boundaries, I take away my shadow. Here is history with its burning questions and theory with its doubt. I give them to a ridiculous man who smells of the sea and slow dancing. How good it must be for the rain to roll around on the street and commingle with each surface. The world is nothing much, grass and rubble and such. I'll put it into a camera filled with silver and potential. Um, Maxine and I, I had the pleasure and, and, and to be astonished by, um, what's his name? Um, Maxine, are you there? Charles, his name was Charles Henri Ford. Have you heard of him? Yeah, so uh, he was one of the early uh, American surrealists too. Uh, and, you know, went to France to be uh, uh, engaged with them. Uh, and we uh, invited him to, this was in 19, early 80s, I think. We were running a reading series in Chicago uh, called the uh, Poetry Center of Chicago. It's the School of the Art Institute. And um, he showed up with his, uh, his friend, uh, 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 his boyfriend, uh, and who played the bongos while he read his poems. And uh, the poems were interesting. And then he said, we're gonna show, I'm gonna show a movie. Whereupon he left and went back to his hotel uh in the middle of his own reading and we watched the uh a color uh, vividly colorful movie that included a lot of erotic entertainment 
uh, including a man, excuse the word, fucking a watermelon. He was a, he was a handsome uh, a Greek gentleman uh, and he disrobed and fucked a watermelon. And I could hear chairs clattering as people were leaving behind me. I was seated in the front row. And so uh, when, the <laughs> when the reading was over, we turned around and there were about six people left of about 125. So I, I think maybe the movie proved to be a little bit offensive, uh, but it was an interesting experience. And we uh, talked about it and murmured about it a long time after that happened. I, I, I'd like, <laughs> so that's my story. Uh, I'll read uh, a couple more uh, poems. And I have no idea if it has any relation to surrealism. Um, uh, dead man writing. And there was dead man walking. So I went for dead man writing. The dead man smells of cigars and roses, of turpentine and persimmons. The dead man yells, but only the cat grown far too thin and a lonely child named Moises can hear him. Erect in a kitchen chair in a place where he had lived, his hand moves slowly over the page. The boy hears him scratching and thinks the cat wants in. Soon he has filled the page, then many pages, but he is not revived. His writing fills one room, then another. The dead man is not distinct from the shadow of his hand. The stain of his pen is great. We believe the world was created in a similar fashion. In most rooms, there's light somewhere, allowing a face to be seen or the size of a dead man's shoe. Light insists more than darkness. It can awaken a room entirely. A mouse also lives there, chased all night by the cat. They move like breath in a furious circle, like the soft liquid of an eye intent upon seeing. And I'll read one more. This is called The Windows of Speech Lit Islands. As if for the first time you recognize the grass, its greenness uncanny and trying to be green. As if for the first time you open a letter that had fallen through the door its message unique to you. Had you been as perhaps you seemed the neighbor, the one whose name was yours, who finally joined the army, had you in fact a country, a life to give, wife and family, as if for a while you could read the signs, remembered to unlearn how the wind feels exactly going up your spine, sense the wheat sinking into the ground nearby, the whiteness of milk, its mystical skirt uplifted, Miss Meat and Miss Gravy, as if the language were smudged with words, speech lit islands that don't submerge in meaning, as if light itself were never in doubt on the question of transcendence. Bees sing, bells ring in the ear's black window. You whisper to the glass, it's passed in sand. Step back, please. A sentence is passing, someone's calling, someone's raining. Doors creaking, contradictions. What bride is not disheveled by all the world's scissors? Make shape shiftings. Been a long time since you wrote yourself in stone. Auto lithographic. I seems to be alone. I suffers in a crowd, but not a yellow room in not a yellow town. Everyone's on loan, but someone here knows why nimble people cry. A bullet makes you die. And then there's you, absent sometimes, laughing as if at last there is no non-journey across the whole word. What are you thinking, conjured of a god? Pears you'll never taste, lines not written. What you know you are, you'll never be again. So thank you, Mark uh, and Cassandra and Jonathan for the invitation. Well, thank you, Paul. Much appreciated. Um, Paul, just one quick question. Um, you, you, you were once a surrealist, right? But, but you would say you're not no longer a surrealist. Is that correct? Well, I wouldn't try to throw out surrealism. I think it's in uh, all of us are impa were impacted by it. Uh, 
and Maxine and I were are quite interested in that. I, I would teach it in my classes, you know, and the, the impact, we always talk, use the word image all the time because, you know, the physical quality of surrealism is, is a, its raw edge, you know, the value of things, uh, you know, um, the, the uncanny uh, disbelief, you know, you, that th all these things exist before us. You know, and, and which is the dream, you know? So, uh, yeah, I think it was very impactful, but I, I wouldn't dare to say I'm either a surrealist or not a surrealist. Um, you know, I wouldn't, you know, to try to abandon. Uh, I was never, though, a, a fully fledged, a full fledged member of some party of surrealism. Yeah, I didn't sign up. <laughs> yeah, Ted, Ted uh, Berrigan was in town. So, 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 so then the question arises, um, do, you, do you have a classification for the kind of poetry you write or, or, or is it just Paul Hoover? Well, Paul Hoover is in many things and many influences uh, swirling around at the same time. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I, you know, I, I did an anthology where I had to accommodate all these tendencies and be kind to them and uh, open to what they were trying to present. So you have the language poets in the same uh, 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 moment with uh, you know, late late romantic uh, poets, right? So uh, surrealism is romanticism. It's the la it's the last movement of romanticism in that direction, uh, and it you know it kept it kept the faith. Uh, I saw, I went to an, uh, an MFA, uh, some kind of event where, oh, it was, it, it was um, uh, a, a major academic meeting and Anna Balakian was speaking. Anna Balakian, of course, was the great historian of surrealism and critic. And as the people were coming in, she turned it and, and said uh, privately, oh, not so many coming in, I guess the moment has passed. Uh, you know, because surrealism was the thing, right? Uh, it had to be, it had a belated impact in the U.S. Uh, and it's it, it's real. Its greatest impact, I think, were, was in Latin America, as far as I could see. Um, anyway, it's wonderful. I love the paintings of Magritte. I think it, they're astounding. Yeah. Yeah. And Dali as well. Yeah. Uh, in... If anyone has ever seen Dali live, um, uh, for example, in in, Tam in what's it, St. Petersburg or Tampa, there's an amazing museum there. Yeah? It's it's incredible to. He was a master of, of detail as well as, as well as he was of bending detail. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, I love the story about. Uh, um, uh, that uh, who I, I'm sorry I just got confused. Who who are the two painters I just mentioned? Dali and Magritte. Magritte. So Mag Magritte, uh, you know, had a bourgeois life to a certain extent and, and dressed like a bourgeois. Uh, and his wife invited some people to uh, come to the house and. Uh, right after they were introduced, Magritte kicked the man in the in the butt. Uh, you know, he, he kicked him in the ass. Uh, and I thought, wow. So he spends his day being a bourgeois gentleman and a, a, a magnificent painter. Uh, but that gesture, you know, the, the surrealist gesture, was was still present. So it's interesting how a, a life can be styled, you know, uh, that in you are more than one being. <laughs> you know, this, the, you know, we have the surrealists in us. Yeah. So anyway, I, I forgot what you originally asked me. I, th I think you covered it, Paul. 
Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, and we probably should move on anyway. So um, next we have Stuart Ross, um, who's published his first literary pamphlet on a photocopier in his dad's office one night in 1979. Through the 80s, he stood on Toronto's Yonge Street wearing signs like, writer, go to hell, buy my book, selling over 7,000 poetry and fiction chapbooks. A tireless literary press activist, he's the co-founder of the Toronto Small Press Book Fair, and now a founding member of Meet the Presses Collective. He had his own imprint, a Stuart Ross book, at Mansfield Press for a decade, and was fiction and poetry editor at this magazine for eight years. In fall 2017, he launched a new poetry imprint, A Feed Dog Book, through Anvil Press. Stuart has edited several literary magazines, including Mondo Hunkamuga, a journal of small press stuff, um, Sid and Shirley, Who Torched Rancho Diablo, question mark, Peter O'Toole, a magazine of one-line poems, and most recently, Hard Scrabble. Um, he is the author of two collaborative novels, two solo novels, two collections of short stories, and 12 full-length poetry books. He's also the publisher of two collections of essays, Confessions of a Small Press Racketeer, and further Confessions of a Small Press Racketeer, both from Anvil Press, and edited the anthology Surreal Estate, 13 Canadian Poems Under the Inputs, um, and that was from Mercury Press, and co-edited Rogue Stimulus, the Stephen Harper Holiday Anthology for a Prorogued Parliament. Uh, from Mansfield Press. Stuart has taught writing workshops from across Canada and works one-on-one -on -one with authors on their manuscripts. He lives in Coburg, Ontario. In spring 2009, Freehand Books released his first short story collection in more than a decade, Buying Cigarettes for the Dog, to an almost unanimous critical acclaim. In 2010, Stuart was writer-in-residence at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. In fall 2013, Mansfield Press released his book of collaborative poems, our Days in Vaudeville, the first such book ever published by a Canadian poet. In 2017, Stuart won the eighth annual Battle of the Bards, presented by the International Festival of Authors and Now magazine. In 2019, he was awarded the prestigious Harbour Front Festival Prize. His work has been translated into French, Spanish, Estonian, Slovene, and Nisorsk. Stuart is currently working on 12 book projects. Welcome, Stuart. Thank you so much. And thank you um, also, uh, thank you also to Jonathan and Cassandra and Mark. Thank you so much for uh, making me part of this incredible festival filled with writers who I've idolized for ages and writers who I will now, um, from now on idolize, who I hadn't been familiar with before. That was a little bit of um, an out of date bio. I, after I won the Nobel prize, I was assassinated by a cotton bowl weevil. Um, and that sort of wraps up the whole bio. I'm gonna start off with, um, a religious poem, I think, because Cassandra's in um, uh, in Australia. There, it must be Sunday, so I thought a religious poem would be a good beginning. It's called Divinity. The finger in my right nostril hears confession from the finger in my left. There's something to think about. And here's another one. This is also a religious poem. It's titled Doxology. It's some. Um, from my book, uh, A Sparrow Came Down Resplendent. And I no longer remember what doxology means, but I know it's something religious related. I look up words and then I write poems under them and then I forget what the words mean. A sparrow came down resplendent from a bunch of clouds, a string trailing from its beak and a fireman below watched this, though he couldn't see the string from where he was, the sparrow came right toward him, where he stood in front of the fire station. The fireman stood his ground as the sparrow opened his beak, and a piece of string, just a tiny piece of white string, came drifting down. The fireman opened his mouth and the string sailed in. It went down his throat and into his gullet as the sparrow winged back into the sky resplendent. In the days that followed, the fireman didn't notice anything much different, except that now he was a fireman with a piece of string inside him. And the sparrow had said unto him, he remembered the sparrow saying, they abide and they endure carry a piece of their nest within you. Don't fuck things up like you usually do, like how you wrecked your family. And the fireman held out his palm 
and the sun shone upon it and many baby birds did there appear. <laughs> um, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump over to this book. This is um, my most recent solo book of poems, Motel of the Opposable Thumbs. And I will mention, um, Paul, that I have the, the motel um, comes from this uh, long poem called Motel Poem, which is uh, for Charles Henry Ford, but it's really long and tedious, so I won't read that one. This is called Efforts, prose poem. I used the biggest words I could think of and spoke with an exaggerated Finnish accent. I cooked only foods requiring the most foul smelling spices and watched only movies based on funeral processions. I smoked filterless cigarettes rolled by Guatemalan resistance fighters. I puffed out my chest and sucked in my ears. Have you ever had your fingers surgically transformed into suction cups and then walked across the sea? ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Do it all you want. See if she cares. It's true. I don't know what a Finnish accent sounds like. I straighten my hair and I curl it. I lift several pounds above my head and breathe heavily. Finland is famous for its, uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to tell you. It is difficult to braid one's toes evenly. My heart is fulsome, like a successful harvest. She has, however, asked me to avoid similes. Do you know how many small dogs you can fit in a copy of A Tree Grows in Brooklyn? Do you know where I buried my lunch? Here is a fact about me, 1983 Finnish fencing champion with 2020 vision. I squirted ketchup on an original Picasso, or perhaps I tackled the man who squirted ketchup on an original Picasso. Choose whichever you prefer. I wear my glasses on my sleeve. Look, now she is picnicking with the creatures of the forest. And I never thought I'd get to read this poem um, in the same room, sort of, as Maxine Chernoff. It's a, it's a, it's a homolinguistic translation of uh, Maxine Chernoff's poem, Granted. It's called Goes Without Saying. Homo linguistic translation is a, a poem translated into the same language it was already written in. So makes the poem redundant, maybe. We'll see. The mug atop your neck, I noticed, approached my nose holder and wet flakes sailed into the security mechanism and out the other side, unclosing the knobbed rectangle. You and I entered and gazed upon transparent panes the colors of grass and sponge toffee. The April to June season was harsher than December to March, whose lobularia maritime and trifolium teemed with the very burden of breathing oxygen, drove us beyond the word repository. In our sleep vessel, we remained for 12 month stretches and unrushed, ingested health restoration devices from one another's drinking vessels. We devoured Charles Dickens and kept our greenbacks in our stockings. Not a thing unclosed while we undertook this. Anyway, I'm gonna skip um, no more educational poems. Uh, I'm gonna move on to this one. Uh, the schools seem pleased, which is after Ted Berrigan. I am too early. The front of my brain drank twice, became a big hit in vaudeville. Am I satisfied? Am I a stalled car? I have acquired skin, which I wear close to the editor of my bones. In the middle of exhaustion, the school seem pleased. They grin, they hammer the great American themes. They drink, the airlines drink. The chapel drinks of its own fragrance. We call this rock and roll. I turn on Prague, but turn off Poland. The bus stops with a grunt. Come home, it rasps. A gift is tied with a ribbon. A scarecrow is tied with a telephone wire. When I wake up, I am the size of an aspirin. My injuries are broadcast on TV. Demonstrations gather in the square filled with the children who have emerged from the corners of curious objects. We have something to tell you, Hart Crane. Um, 
I'm going to move on to uh, a recent poem and then maybe go back to Motel of the Opposable Thumbs. I think that Cassandra said I could read for 10 to 12 hours. So I'm going to, I'm going to take advantage of every, of every moment. So I should be finished at about 4 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. This poem is called Tea Time. My nose becomes bored with the rest of my face. It tugs in this direction and that, then manages to crawl across my left cheek, down the side of my neck, onto my shoulder, where it jumps to freedom. Embarrassed by the empty plane of my face, I don't leave my house. I hide in the back room and find a copy of Gogol. I open to a random page and an ant crawls out and onto my wrist, up my arm, my shoulder, my neck, across my cheek and onto my face. My arm and neck tickle as a trail of ants follow their leader, gathering just south of my eyes. There they set up a utopian society, a model for the rest of the planet. They call it undulating mass nation. My friends call me Ant Nose. I do the talk show circuit, and when the public becomes bored, I am relegated to a circus side show. Thirty years pass. When I die, the ants leave, disgusted. I lie in my coffin, unable to smell my own decomposition. Each day, I expected to hear a scampering of nostrils on my grave. My nose come back to join me. But all I hear is the rattle of a rusted kettle telling me my tea is finally ready. I'm going to pop back to Motel of the Opposable Thumbs for a prose poem here, um, which I've lost the bookmark for. So that's interesting. I'll find it. The hell's it called? Oh, here we are. Whatever you desire. Look at the tree burst from the top of my skull so recently moan as my friends disappear. Look at my car losing control and sliding off the road into the snowy ravine as my friends disappear. Look at the drunken sky pressing its ugly belly into the fragile mountains about to collapse as my friends disappear. Look at the fine zigzag cracks forming at my ankles and spreading toward my groin as my friends disappear. Look at Saul Bass's credits for Vertigo as my friends disappear. Look at the rabbits cowering in the closet of the motor vehicle registration office as outside the air becomes filled with balloons as my friends disappear. Look at the blood leaking from this plate of vegetables as my friends disappear. Look at my father phoning me once again from the dead. He forgot to mention that he buried all the Monopoly pieces in a Seagram's bag in the backyard on Panny Hill Road as my friends disappear. Look at my friends, the backs of their heads, their brains pushing out of their ears again, their legs moving like mechanical stilts, their words spilling from their mouths like blinking neon lights as my friends disappear. Look at the remains of the soldier I pretended to kill in the staircase of my high school in 1974. Look at the door lying in the center of the lawn and imagine what would happen if you opened it. Look at my grandmother's Russian accent. Look how she fries up the chicken fat. Look at her putting my grandfather's dinner on the tray in front of him as my friends disappear. Look at the crane in the distance smell the gasoline as you stand in front of your brother's grave. Look at the frightened boll weevil. Look at the cartoon penguin on the TV as mother lies in a coma as my friends disappear. Look at the clock. Look at the tangled hair in the comb. Look at the oil the car left on the road and how it glistens and takes on the shape of whatever you desire. And uh, just uh, two more poems. One is a one word poem, so I'll just show it to you. So find it. It's from my book, uh, uh, Hamburger in a Gallery, which is named after Klaus Oldenburg's Floor Burger, which was in the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, starting in the mid 60s. I and mean, I was six years old when my mom took me to see it. And I thought, oh my God, a hamburger can be a piece of art. So that was really an exciting revelation for me. I'll just um, hold this one poem up here. Whoops, let's see if I can. There we go. Give you some time to really mull it over. Long. 
Gulad. Yeah. You read that very well. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm just going to read yeah, one more poem from an, an older book um, uh, called Rosofsky at Peace. Rosofsky was my family name. And then they changed it to Ross in the 50s because they thought it would be a little, I don't know, safer. And uh, so I invented a character named Rosofsky and uh, put him on the cover of my book. And again, I just want to thank everyone for, um, thank all the organizers, the Lip Balm people. This is such an amazing series always. And I'm so honored to read as part of it. And I want to thank the uh, four or five Canadians who had tuned in this evening. I appreciate that too. And everyone else. This is called Sueño Perdido after Valerie Larbeau. Oh, endless gray clouds choking the sky, black moon, invisible stars, distant squeal of tires beneath the shell of a car with a tree growing through it. Oh, various trembling monsters that lurched through cold, empty cellars and whose scribbled claws swipe from beneath my bed, who await me in places I'll never go. Oh, constant clatter of locomotives through my chest, tiny trembling pigeon lodged in my bowels, ill-formed kernels of love glittering in the back of my throat, in my shoulders, in the palms of my hands. Oh, vivid memories of decades before my birth of all the pain I've caused and the pain for which I bear no blame, the peaceful dreams of those dear to me, the misspelled, eroded headstones shrouded in mist. Oh, chaos, exhaustion, bliss, confusion, serenity, blankness, panic, quiet, quiet. Oh, endless roaring clouds rolling over my head, I offer you this my lost sleep. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Stuart. Uh, wonderful to have you with us. Um, and next, uh, we're going to see something that is poetic, but not poetry. Uh, we shall be experiencing the contorting talents of Dalia Fatal, who is an award-winning traveling burlesque performer, contortionist and instructor. Dalia's performances combine the smoothness of a lifetime of classical dance training with the tease of slow burn burlesque and the bizarre and superhuman styling of contortion. Dalia will be performing her surrealist contortionist show accompanied by a musical piece written and performed by myself. It's called Sargasso C. Welcome Dalia. Hey Mark, can I get access to screen share so I can pipe the music through? Yes, we'll have to make you a co-host. Can you do that Cassandra? Yep, just give me a sec. Not my strong point. It's all good. Zoom is a whole nother world. <laughs> <laughs> um, there you go. Hey, let's see if I can do this thing now. Share sound. I will be sharing the screen in just a moment. I apologize. We're just going to have to go with this. And I have started my video, so if you want to switch it over. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dalia. That was amazing. Um, so poetry in motion, no, just, no, nothing else to say, really. Um, and surrealist to boot. Thank you so much. Um, he is coming up next, and he's a writer, artist, and singer songwriter. His fifth collection of poetry, Aqua Spinach, from Juramondo in Australia, was launched in Melbourne and Sydney in late 2018, and he was shortlisted for the LAS Gold Medal. In addition to his highly regarded books, which include Jam Sticky Vision and New Works on Paper, his poetry has been published widely in Australia and internationally and has been translated into many languages. Luke is a singer songwriter and he performs as Cornflake Sunset um, from 2009 to 2015. He fronted the band New Archer with drummer Ian Wadley from Minimum Chips and New Archer's debut EP Bees Nudge the Mouth of a Feathered Rose was released on Gaga in 2013. Luke had his first solo drawing exhibition in 2011. Uh, he lives in Melbourne. Welcome, Luke. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd um, start this reading from um, Jam Sticky Vision, which is um, a book from a few years ago. Um, it includes uh, the, the cover image is actually a, um, um, it's the back of a, of a of an album by the um, sort of indie band Pavement. I thought I'd mention that given there's probably a, quite a few people from California in the audience. Um, this first poem's called A Thousand Characters, um, sort of after Raymond Russell. Um, this too is about a thousand characters. It's much like the last one. I wouldn't even read beyond the following sentence. The following sentence is a silky thing, purple in the late day, drizzled in smog. Inside a microwave oven is milk rising to warmth. Inside the dusk is an excuse for certain birds to frolic on the freshly cut lawn too long, picking at insects. They're eaten by sparrow hawks. It's pretty gruesome. The rugby team on their regular jog start slipping on the mess of birds. From a distance, it looks like a scrum or naval exercise. It's getting dark remarkably quickly in the clouds. Just above the line of trees which form the horizon here are salmon pink. At the local gelati shop, they call it grapefruit. Navy tinges fringe the pale pink. Fish await. It's beyond human understanding how someone might have reached this sentence. I could write about pork, the sparrow hawk eats well and feeds the parts of its name to its young, and its young feed parts of their own name to their first flight. Nature as documentary now, and it's where we slip. See the magpie on the end of my sandwich? I knew it was to be written, probably, and it curved here like a ball in a stadium, but there is no crowd, bird, alone in the credits. Some gaffers, Giraffes with appalling foot rot trot over to the microphone and disco ball concussions, the wild shining toffee of the dance floor on this afternoon as the moon pierces in. Okay, um, I'm going to switch to um, my recent book, Aqua Spinach. Um, which, which um, the cover image is a still from the the movie Uncle Boon Me, who can recall his fast, uh, sorry, <laughs> who can recall his past lives, which is a an Apichat Pong Wurasat Kun film. Um, the covers of um, most of my books are stories in themselves, trying to kind of figure out if we can get permission to use the the image. Um, this piece is called the Lobster. Um, which is named after the, um, the film of that name, a Yorgos Lanthimos, the film. Um, I guess a lobster is sort of like, almost like, I feel like it's an iconic sort of surrealist image as well, or, or animal. Of course, Andre Breton named him the conquistador of the dream life. Surrealism flirts on the basis of negative aroma whiff and double numbers 
in the mucky art of pure nomenclature. Mold on the other side of a V, coagulated in a little night scene in the adult hospital play. The clean purpose and meter. Oh, the receptionist went, and he didn't, or mind. Songs only owned or copied unnamed signatures. Oh, flamboyant, loopy wise, polished nails, the color of shipping containers. Call. Ah, said the patient. Err, went the theory, otherwise solvent afterthought. <laughs> Um, because I've been sitting in my little back room here for, <laughs> for the last sort of hour and a half or so, I'm really quite cold. So if I seem nervous, I'm actually more cold than nervous. Because <laughs> of course here it's um, 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning in Melbourne. Um, <clears throat> and it's like five degrees or something. Um, any Bob Dylan fans in the, in the room? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is called um, More on Bob Dylan's Day. <laughs> they called him Dylan <clears throat> because he kept a harmonica along his cough. He coughed gently through his nose. His nose was the shape <clears throat> of half an opening silver gum wrapper, and I was having a game of golf with him. We had played four days, and I could already sense that a thought itself was beginning to distract Dylan's putting. He put it over on my niblick shoe and I didn't flinch. The way arborists fell a tree across the yard, mid-conversation, already drinking the tea you offered them on arrival. His swing, like that of the very tree, was nasally. I guess that's also why, why they called him Dylan. Bob, I yelled that day instead of four, and we laughed. It's just, I couldn't bring him to a point. My sister called Dylan's dilemma a red flag, but in truth, many of the holes held red flags, and there was no breeze at all, just a dribble either side of the pin, which I used to write this. Um, it was fun kind of looking through my poems to try and sort of pick out pieces that were a little more um, sort of aligned with surrealism. And this one's called Buñuel's. We may have to catch the bus out of the building, glistening and ascending into soft options, crowded sticky seats. So these poems recipe themselves a bit. Though I provide no insight into competition or televised hairsprayed lettuce flexing in air conditioning. This kitchen scene is one attempt. The delight at 3.30 p.m., a pew mongrel in the arch of secular air temperature. If you sit up on the sink, you will, and I can show you the water runs until pipes cool and antelope tart, tarted, it, the literature, envelopes to a raw package of sunlight inching towards the express box. Postage box we know, and friends wobble into pregnancy. Wow. She craves sliced kites, and her coffee closed on my armpit until the doors flung open and disembarked anthologies pixelated in the last few syllables of a poppy popped pop po doggy. This, I thought I'd read the last line of this poem. He did extremely odd jobs, replaced putty in water features with translucent afterbirth. Um, a few years ago, I was lucky enough to um, go to the Beinecke Library in New Haven and, and um, to Barbara Guest's uh, archive, because I wrote my thesis on Barbara Guest. And um, of course, I spent a lot of time at MoMA on my way through um, 
and I wrote this in a little cafe in the middle, you know, on the third floor or whatever, um, in the middle of a blizzard. Um, And uh, there's a nice little link to um, Paul Hoover's mention of ARP as well. Um, it's called A Hat. I had been walking for 10 to 15 minutes without a hat. Inside the hat, I was able and I was able. Customer accounts. Phlegm of coat rack hardened around my shoulders. Amok this gunky silvery circumstance, I made a decision or it, it was the des tha ma, the maid ago, idled along another coriander blemish, awning, team, to ever, day, docent, soup with three full or stopped up chicken coffer, up. I had been walking alongside water lilies, you can, two, have to, Take me till I walked into the early 20th century and spied up, up in the late, or buy it, MoMA, said warm itinerary. I have it. And I might just finish. Thank you, um, Lit Balm organizers, for inviting me. Um, um, I was okay once I had my coffee this morning when I got up at 6 a.m. and. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to read with all of these um, wonderful poets and in the context of surrealism. Um, uh, this poem is called White Lines on Pink. After Tony Tuxin. Um, Tony Tuxin is, I guess, uh, Australia's sort of answer to abstract expression, expressionism. Was huge, he was hugely influenced by abstract expressionist painters and if you're not familiar with Tony Tuxin's paintings, I, I highly recommend it. It's a stunning, stunning painter. Um, I arrived by the pink bark stripped eucalyptus tree last Sunday and went straight to bed. I slept in the pink light of a eucalyptus tree. Sleeping was easy until I dreamed the bark stripped from my own pillow, owl embroidered childhood pillow collected in, in dream lichen, fluorescent, and waiting on kindling. Something I could possibly trace back to a family tree, to the nomenclature of an arborist's labor. Apples, while the sound of the river refused any softening. I sat close to its stereo, woke up in pins and needles. To acknowledge the fireplace here, and the fireplace in the sound of the second home in my childhood, Smoke flooded the house, the brickwork at poor angles, a shout ricocheting off the river as I made the bed and prepared breakfast simply and with turned eggs and the eye of the EG always drawing on emotion caused by repetition. Thank you. Thank you, Luke, so much. Yes. Amazing. Um, next, we welcome FJ Bergman who writes poetry and speculative fiction, and sometimes simultaneously uh, imagines tragedies on near or far exoplanets. Uh, FJ is the poetry editor of Mobius, the Journal of, Journal of Social Change. Check it out, it's an amazing journal uh, online. Um, she's also managing editor and my co-collaborator at Mad Hat Press. Um, she's poetry editor for Weird House Press, um, and she freelances as a copy editor and a book designer. She lives in Wisconsin with a husband, intermittent daughters, and a horse or two. She's competed at National Poetry Slam with Madison Urban Spoken Word Slam team. While she has no academic literary qualifications, she is kind to those so incumbent. She thinks imagination can compensate for anything. Welcome. What matters? In the future, poetry had become the arrangement of tangible objects. Everybody had a poem outdoors along an imaginary line on the lawn in front of their house. A disparate array of items was important, but not mandatory. 
Almost invariably, these included a very large rock. Typically, poets would use only material taken from nature, bird nests, driftwood, icicles, dead snakes. Lately, there had been a faddish tendency to add a six pack of dwarf marigolds. One rather self-referential composition was nothing more than 10 metric wrenches laid end to end. And an emerging surrealist had buried a bicycle to its axles in green sand. Its practitioners were secretly insecure about the parameters of their art. They sometimes met in open parks and pastures for public displays of new work, most of them pushing little red wheelbarrows laden with the lumpy tools of their trade. The unburdened were those who specialized in found poetry. The most critical aspect was the length of the line. No one knew what the ideal dimensions ought to be, but they all carried folding rulers. Passers-by would often stop to measure a poem that seemed inadequate or excessive and argue at great length about whether size mattered. This poem has an epigraph from the Chicago Manual of Style, which I worship. Here, the comma after flute and the colon after image are optional rather than required. Point of order. There, the night succeeds day. Love comes before marriage and almost inevitably summer precedes the autumn. But here we value our freedom to follow any object or idea with another thing no matter how wildly infelicitous such pairings may seem to a stranger in our land. A sedilla may follow harpsichord or a pancreas occur after portrait. Random orderings are encouraged. One might find oneself in a bus queue with various persons, objects, or ideas, each with its chosen attendant. An orchid accompanied by a portable toilet the poet behind a red wheelbarrow, or see in a shop window a firm ultimatum with a fjord or a raw beefsteak nuzzling a java applet. While frowned upon, it happens that stalking may occur from time to time. Thus, one occasionally encounters an entity in hot pursuit of another who disdains or fears the connection between them the albatross waddling after wedding cake, the number 10 envelope with a hopeless affection for trapeze, even a bubble bath drawing ever closer to blow dryer. I myself am trailing despondently in the wake of an abstract concept too revolting to explain just at the moment, but no relationship is forbidden in this infinite and eternal universe of disorder and delight. Grand Tour. First, the Atlas began to fret and wheedled in a low voice. Then one of the Lonely Planet books egged on the National Geographics until they ruffled their pages in hysteria and the Michelin guides started slapping their covers rhythmically against the bookends. When the Club Med brochures folded themselves into airfoils and began dive bombing us, we made a break for the carport dragging our hastily packed luggage behind us, a litter of outdated and dilapidated maps snapping at our heels. We found that all roads lead to more, more roads with similar billboards. We drive all day long. Each evening, we arrive at a different city before its gates close and rent a room filled with clear water. The video camera runs all night and prepares a nutritious breakfast. If a museum opens early, we spend the morning gliding from room to room, leaving nothing as we found it. Even the guards have uniforms of a different hue when we are finished with them, and all the visitors have come to believe that surrealism is the manifesto of a concealed desire for economic instability. 
and wear faint greenish halos, which they will never see. Medical history. Between my fourth and fifth ribs is a fistula, an opening. Fabergé Easter egg window into my heart. Just a moment, I'll uh, unbutton my shirt. Come closer and you can peek into a small sunlit garden surrounded by a clipped hedge, an intimate landscape with mossy indistinct ruins sinking into the curves of undulating lawn. I can't see it myself. The mirror is never at quite the right angle, but my friends and my cardiologist tell me all about it. They say it is always sunny in there, although there are clouds on the horizon. Occasionally, someone will claim to see mountains in the distance, and once a child said he saw the turrets of a tiny city beyond the faraway hills. No viewer has ever seen a single human or animal in my heart, not even an insect, although I am told that there are many flowers whose faint delectable perfume is a rare emanation, which I may only be imagining. The shadows shift, but the phenomenon we call sun is always behind the onlooker and never sets. Sometimes a longer, more angular shadow looms across the grass. Whatever casts that dark movement remains invisible. wall. My neighbor said he thought he'd build a wall, wanted to know if I'd go halves on it. I asked him what he was going to make it out of, and he said, words. And I said I'd help him out as much as I could. I asked him how high he was going to make it, and he said, high. He started out with long Latinate words, at least five syllables, carefully staggering the joints but he ran out of his own almost right away, so I had to give up a lot of mine. He tried to maintain a structured form, but soon it degenerated into a random jumble, mostly nouns and verbs. He was saving the adjectives to decorate it when it was finished, he said, stacking them neatly against the porch. The articles and conjunctions kept falling out and accumulated in forlorn drifts at its base. He worked on it every evening after coming home from his regular job until night fell late into the autumn. Joggers would occasionally stop to offer advice and put in a word or two. It spread like a blackthorn hedge above its massive foundations, tangling tightly as the barbed seraphs hooked together. The wind whistled through the small openings of the A's and E's as the larger counters of the O's, B's, P's, D's, and Q's resonated at a lower pitch. He placed the sharpest words on top of the wall. Expect trouble, he said. During the winter, the ascenders and descenders began to distort and twine around letters in adjoining words. Just before the solstice, I hung the most ornate plural nouns and third person singular verbs I could find on the north side of the wall. Dangling from each terminal S, they swung like bells, chiming as the snows fell. That spring, suffocuses sprouted from the side that faced the sun. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Akshay. That, that was absolutely wonderful. And next we have from Jeffrey Cyphers Wright, uh, who is an artist, critic, eco-activist, impresario and publisher, but is best known as a poet associated with the new romanticism and the New York School. He, studied, he received his MFA in poetry from Brooklyn College, where he studied with Allen Ginsberg and also taught. He served the Poetry Project Board of Directors of St. Mark's Church and also taught there. From 87 to 2000, he ran cover magazine, The Underground National. From 87 to 2000, 
Um, sorry, excuse me. I think uh, during that this time, he also served on the board of Mason Gross School of Arts. He is the author of 17 books of verse, including most recently from Blue Liar, uh, Blue Liar from Dos Madres Press, um, radio poems from the operating system, and fake lies from Felt Swoop. Uh, Jeffrey contributes criticism regularly to the American Book Review and Art Nexus. He is a longtime resident of the East Village in New York City, where he raised both his sons. Recently, he received a Kathy Acker Award for writing and publishing. Currently, he produces literary events at New York City, in New York City at La Mama, Howl, Happening, and KGB Lit Bar in conjunction with his annual and poetry journal, Live Mag, which is an amazing journal. Please check it out. Jeffrey is also the creator of the Lip Balm Surrealist Puppetry Show, which we have experienced the last two nights. Welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I wanted to... Uh... Thank you and thank everybody. Dare to be fun. Crows cackle in their gym crack cadences, calling all at once, oblivious to cold or getting old, oblivious to decadence. White whiskers and dry whiskey and a little punch from Judy, just a taste. The wind is doing a duet with the dumpster to see which one is louder. I used to love a banshee, but now I love the banished, wired to the sun, lighting the wick in wicked. Promise you'll come back here. That's, so that's from Blue Liar, designed by Lori Ortiz. And I wanted to jump back to Triple Crown because I also wanted to thank Todd Thillman from Spite and Dival. Uh, actually, he recommended me to Mark, and then Mark asked me to do this, and I had so much fun making those movies, I gotta say. It was really, really a treat. So I wanted to read one from Triple Crown. This is uh, Three Crowns of Sonnets, The High Crown, which has uh, 14, and each one has a prelude. Made in, every one of these is made in some place. And this one, and it was pan mythologic. It had uh, a lot of mythological characters. And Emily Bronte is my girlfriend in these poems. They're sort of a great serial poems here. She was a great girlfriend too. Made in Santa Cruz. Before we are destroyed, let Hutash pre prepare a rainbow bridge, a method for the madness. Our world come tumbling down laughing all the way to the banquet, chained to the soft monster. The subjugator was here at a loss for words, baying, seek a keepsake, now release, sign here. Emily, a bell torn from the sun. I wake in a forest of cherry smoke, love hammer in the dream spout, heaven's tomahawk stuck in my hat. Made in Siam. Put my heart in a sling, send it to Singapore, my little songbird from Alcatraz. The Dow rose and the S&P fell. The cubs are pitching a fit. Dream cops tailing me on Bowery, eavesdropping on the angel exchange. Victor giving me wild leeks to eat. Cockeyed and busted, the drawbridge stuck. Gate crasher written all over your face. I woke lashed to the spoke, gagging, Emily Bronte, retching up rune chunks, nothing between us but terminal presence, the virtual host seamlessly maintained. Let me say it again, the way out is the way in. Made in Freeport. Dogwoods whimper outside Hotel Dumont as time reshuffles its dog-eared deck. Besieged by the storm's monocle, beseeching sun to auger through felt sky, my face cut by rain on the bridge to eternity, strewn among thistles, my wishes shred, Orpheus staring back at love's wreck. I tackle the poem, running on all fours. In a rush, you leave jet earrings behind. With blinkered tears, you're unable to shed. The token booth clerk yelling, pay your fare. 
Emily Bronte forwards her unsheathed breath. I was going to go on forever and a month, but now I see you have saved the best for last. Um, I came to surrealism in a sort of a mild roundabout way being at West Virginia University. And uh, there was a library, I was working in the library and they had a fabulous collection of the Russian futurists and Mayakovsky especially spoke to me and they, they had a lot of Spanish po surrealists I felt like too, uh, like Lorca and Jimenez and that whole thing with going down to the south that Paul mentioned and, and um, yeah, uh, the Spanish influence with Neruda and everybody. And then up here in New York, we were really lucky around uh, St. Mark's to have Ron Padgett also, who was translating all these people and made us super aware of people like Rene Char and Philip Sipolt and uh, Prevert and his book Parole. So that was really cool. I got to tell a quick story about Charles Henry Ford since his name came up. So Lita Hornick, the great culture queen, took me to dinner with Charles and John Ashbery and Eugene, his, John's friend. And I was calling everybody a maniac all the time then for a little while. And I said something to, very friendly to Charles and said, oh, you, you handsome maniac or something, you know? And he goes, I assure you, sir, I am not a maniac with his wonderful Mississippi drawl. So I wanted to uh, also uh, pay tribute here um, to thank Paul uh, for publishing a couple of my poems in this issue of New American Writing. And so um, I was going to read Origin of the Species. Don't give me those woof woof eyes, that dark and stormy look at KGB bar where sharks offer swimming lessons. Don't hurt yourself trying to be like me, although it couldn't hurt. Don't put lipstick on a ghost. Never collide with a kaleidoscope or have a cow if you get a bum steer. Don't harbor a grudge. The water isn't deep enough. Don't give up. Keep licking night till it shines like sweating jet. I dreamed a green star rose high on our left. Don't hold your breath. And I feel like that green star is um, Greta Thunberg. <laughs> who's rising on our left, let's hope, right? And now, also, I wanted to thank Steve Luttrell for publishing a couple of things here in the New Cafe Review. And uh, this one's called uh, Dalliance with the Dervish. This one's a little long. I'm gonna read this one. <laughs> Les Fleurs de Nuit. Dream I'm swimming with Ron and smoking a J in the East River. Dream I take too many silly pills. I've lost my marbles, says Jennifer. Dream I get to the airport on time for a change, but can't return the car. Dream I back out of a bank robbery. Dream I'm kidnapped by Cersei's twin. Dream you are a ladybug and I am Calbane. Onyx spots on scarlet wings. You search my upturned face. We share an accident of grace. Learn by doing, lead by dreaming, untie knots of wind by breathing. And I wanted to just uh, read a couple of the newer ones here, starting with um, Echo's Chamber, which is a funny title. Uh, actually, I'm going to start with this one because it has an epigraph. Cindy Hogman will be proud of me for getting it right this time, I hope. And Lydia Cortez, I'm gonna shout out to everybody, you know. So uh, Temporary Sanity, the epigraph is by Philip Lamantia, forever in the sweat of fire. Winter's white heart steams, Venus pins night to the sky, a few stars are hung out to dry. On call at the dream hospital, my gang of bells rings, me and you in the pitch light, throb like a pulsar. <clears throat> Listen, your canals can hear my eyelids beating time into wings of gold foil. All of what I say to you comes with a money back guarantee. And snow only really talks when it starts to melt. And then this. 
the author's progress. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to find Echo's Chamber now. Here it comes. Here it comes. And this also has an epigraph by Leo Tolstoy. Mutual love is the law of human life. Echo's Chamber. A fat moon trundles across the sky, a Mack truck with one headlight. I sleep alone in night salon, pining like a nut. The only thing better than one guitar is two guitars. Your sunglasses reflecting my eyes in July's jonquiled haze. Resistance is futile, whatever you say. The DJ is my best friend. Gulls laugh at love's slaughter. I hear you rule with an iron caress. My ears blaze in your absence. And this, uh, you know, those movies had the puppets in them and I was doing a lot of puppets and they actually, one puppet wrote that last poem, Miss, uh, Miss Tremont wrote her own poem, but uh, the puppets made it into my poems too. So this is called Here For You. October lights a lantern in the aspens under your window. The river unties night's black ribbon and lays back eager to continue swapping whoppers. After the yawning contest, we'll put the final touch on our opera booth and bask in each other's wilderness, knocking on the lockdown's door. My puppets file for unemployment and burn their orders from Moscow Mitch, lambaste the bastards. Okay, who ordered the turkey cobbler? I dream I drive an empty limousine. There's a place for you to fill in. There's a place for here for you to fill in, rhymes with limousine. So shout out again for Cindy Hogman and Karen Newberg who published The Quick Key in the first literary review at East. The Quick Key. <laughs> Ever shrinking path to glory's kennel, sunsets corsage smudges the Hudson, cormorants command black pilings, loneliness spreads grape cush wings, who says you have to work late? Who insists you flirt with posterity? Time races on in a black thunderbird, ashes knocking at the fire door. Who says you need to guard the exit? A burning submarine fingering the sea. Fun melts away as you polish light, chasing the hounds of fame. Razor thin euphoria is a wake up call. The party is here inside these cells. Uh, Peter the Great, I'm going to skip, but it's a great, it's a fun title, isn't it? Hyperion takes a hit. Uh, I just want to end here with um, Ask Me, uh, which is just accepted for uh, from Main Street Rag. Ask Me. The wolf moon goes down like butter on our pancakes made with bean flour. Wind acts as white blazes on the black, brackish Hudson. Daily errands arise, transcribing the diary of Minerva's owl, adding scarred sparks to fire's engine, zeroing in on water's flying roots. This is where I find you, half hidden in the bulrushes, naked and alone. Dirty silence pushes us together combing honey from our unity as we inherit a new birth in every breath. I know a keeper when one comes along. Miracles are makeable, if you ask me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, thank, you, thank you all. Charles Alexander. Thank you, Linda Black. Thank you, Luke Beasley, Andrew Geron, Maxine, uh, sorry, Paul Hula, um, Jeffrey Cyphers Wright, of course, who we just saw, Stuart Ross, Dahlia Fatale, and FJ Bergman. Thank you all so much. And don't forget, tomorrow we have Andrew Geron, we have Charles Bernstein, Robert Archambault, Kerry Atta, uh, we have Maxine Chernoff, we have Sam Truitt, we have Michael Ruby, Pierre Joris. Nicole Perafit, Nikki Javashilo, and uh, Kieran O'Driscoll from Ireland. 
So please do join us tomorrow, same time, same, same back channel. And to conclude, a little, little, a tiny little excerpt from Andre Breton and Philip Suppose the magnetic fields. The lake we crossed with an umbrella, the unsettling iridescence of the earth, all that makes us want to disappear. A man walks while cracking hazelnuts and at times folds into himself like a fan. He heads for the lounge where the ferrets have preceded him. If he arrives for the closing, he'll see underwater gates opening away for the honeysuckle boat tomorrow or the another next day. He'll go and find his wife who's waiting for him while stitching together lights and threading tears. The worm filled apples in the ditch and the echo of the Caspian Sea try with all their might to keep their emerald powder. His hands are as sorrowful as a snail's horns. He clamps his hands in front of him. Everything illuminates him with his lukewarm, lukewarm reasoning like the body of a dying bird. He listens to the contractions of stones on the road and they devour each other like fish. The glassmaker's spittle gives him starry thrills. He tries to find out what he has become since his death. And thank you everybody for a wonderful evening. Thank you all for participating and hope to see you tomorrow night at 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, well, what can I say? Poetry, love, and understanding. Somewhere along the lines of John Lennon. Good night, folks. See you tomorrow, everyone. Mwah. Peace, love, and surrealism.